the governments and the central bankers really guided us away from us, uh, away from it at the same time that they're buying at hand over fist. So I would really say now, look, I've been studying currency since 1987. We have a strategy what, that we look at historical patterns and therefore what is the next most likely outcome. So you've got to have gold and silver in your portfolio simply because it's real in your possession, right? ETF, sell that kind of garbage. If you don't hold it, you don't own it. That That is just a trust. So you need physical in your possession, which is real money at a point where it should be now with inflation, obvious to everybody that central bankers have destroyed the purchasing power value of the currency. So that's why you have to have it. As far as the amount goes, that part depends on your personal level of comfort and what you're willing to lose and what you're wanting to protect. And then beyond that, do you want to get in a position to not just survive what we're going through, which is a currency reset, social, economic, and financial, but do you want to be in a position to take advantage of it? Because I believe, you know, I've been a stockbroker, I've been a banker, I've been in these markets on some level since 1964, quite honestly. And I've learned a lot over that period of time. But the system is so corrupt and fake right now. And what has to happen is a complete reset of the entire system. And that's why you need gold. But how much are you willing to lose? Because they can drive the stock market up to a trillion dollars. But those dollars have no purchasing power. Last time I checked, a trillion times zero is zero. So because of my personal background, I do not own any stocks, any bonds, any ETFs, any mutual funds, any annuities, any, any of those fiat money products, government debt-based products. I am all in on physical gold and physical silver, which I hold. The other part of that, I think it makes a whole lot of sense to hold the lion's share of your wealth in an undervalued asset that is in a long-term positive trend and the least amount of your wealth in an overvalued asset or instrument that's in a long-term negative trend. And so the real trend is not the stock market or the cryptocurrencies or anything else. It's the purchasing power of the currency. And officially there's three cents left but as inflation continues to heat up, because I, I do think we are in the beginning phases of the hyperinflation, then that will go to zero. When people lose confidence in the currency, it will go to zero. Then how much of your wealth do you want to be holding in these? Additionally, when I'm talking about value, because that's really what you want to know, where, where is it going to go, right? So what's the true value of an ounce of gold? That's also what I call the fundamental value because one thing I can guarantee you is at some point, all assets go to fundamental value. That's not complicated. What gets a little more complicated, a little more nuanced is knowing how to determine what that value is because you can't listen to the guys on Wall Street to tell you what that value is. They have an agenda. So. Since gold is real money, good money, and dollars, yuan, yen, whatever, is government-based money, the way to know how much this would go to, an ounce of gold would go to during a reset, it, I, I do it really simply because I'm not going to get you to the penny and I don't care anyway about that, is you take all of the debt that's been created because that's how dollars are created or any government-based money is created by debt. And you can use that as a proxy for actually how much currency and how much fiat money has been created because they've taken that data away from us. And then you divide it by all the gold that exists in the whole wide world, whether it's in ground or it's above ground because gold is indestructible. 
And that, the last time I checked, it'll be higher now because there's more debt. But the last time I checked, that was like 13,500 bucks. So with spot trading around, you know, 1940, 60, 80, 2000, 5,000 even, right? It's a bargain. Um, first of all, there is a certain cost because you can't push a button on a computer and create this, right? So the all-in mining cost is somewhere around, um, don't hold me to this because I have the data right in front of me, but somewhere around $1,268 an ounce. And then it'll go up from there, but that's where it is right now. So the all-in cost, the cost to mine, um, and then to turn it into coinage or whatever else you're gonna turn it into, that actually supports the underlying price in terms of fiat money of, of the gold. But what we've also really witnessed is the U.S. can block the gold sales from Russia in within their realm of influence, so NATO, fellow NATO countries or allies, but, you know, not in China, not in India. And India, frankly, has a history of going around sanctions and trading with countries like Iran, um, Turkey and Venezuela. And all these transactions have been done with gold because the currencies really have no value. And so what we saw Russia do in the buildup to it is accumulate, get rid of, divest themselves of a lot of dollars and build their reserves of gold. And so they are not suffering as much as they would have if they didn't have that gold because that gold is really their savings. Taking it down to an individual level because that's what I really use all of these lessons for. Because it doesn't matter whether you're a government, a corporation, or an individual. The laws of economics really work the same for everybody. The governments and central banks just have the advantage that they could push a button and create fiat money out of thin air. But at the end of the day, they too have to go by all of those laws and restrictions. And so I would bring up in that same breath what we saw happen in Canada with protesters and how they were cut off from anything that they held in the system, just like Russia was cut off from what they held inside of the system that other governments could just take. Because the reality is, if you don't hold it, you don't own it, and your perception doesn't mean anything in a court of law. Yeah, well, it's significantly higher than 8.75 particularly when you look at food, what's that up 40% year over year, and housing is up like 28% year over year. But they also have the cost of caviar in there, and I don't think that's gone up as high. And it's, seriously, they actually use this in an example. In, you know, in the same category, you can have a can of tuna fish, you can have a can of caviar, and that's the same category. So, you know, hedonics that kind of massages all of the numbers to make it look pretty. But when it's noticeable, when you go to the grocery store to buy the food, it's, it's harder to hide, right? If gold isn't going up in price, how is it a hedge against inflation? Anything can happen on the short term, especially when you control all of the uh, markets and they're just paper markets. But you, you step back and you look a little further and you can see. So what we know is that 6,000 years ago was an ounce of gold to buy a suit of armor. In early 1900s, it was a $20 one ounce of gold, $20 gold coin to buy a really nice men's suit. And today, at the price level that it is, could you buy a nice man's suit for 2,000 bucks? Mm -hmm. So it does it. Uh, short term, they can manipulate anything. Longer term, then they can't. So that is how it is a hedge against inflation because it's good money. It's savings based. It takes time, energy <clears throat> to pull it out of the ground. And it's used across the entire spectrum of the global economy, every area. 
So there's always the broadest base of buyer and the broadest base of functionality. That's how. And then ultimately, when they have to reset the currency because all confidence is lost, they do it against gold, those overnight resets, they do it against gold. And, and, even, and even like on a, on a day-to-day basis, one thing that's hard for people to realize, but, but it's the genius of what they put together, evil genius, but still the genius of it. Because if they can keep inflation at a low level, and that's why if they can keep it at a low level, they get what they want, but you don't complain. <laughs> You don't ask for higher wages. And so both Paul Volcker and Alan Greenspan defined price stability, not as the price is staying the same, but that they go up slowly enough that you don't consider them when you're going in to get a job. It's the wage inflation. That's the price stability that the central bankers are concerned with. Because when they set up this whole system to begin with, there were many points to it, but two key points for governments, they wanted to be able to tax you without going to legislation so you didn't know and you couldn't complain. And for corporations, they wanted to pay their workers less. But hey, if you're used to getting 20 bucks, you're not gonna accept 10. So if they can make that $20 bill spend like 10, then you accept it, And you don't ask for more money, even though, I mean, stop and think about it. In in 1971, the average wage was 9,500 bucks and a family of four could live with one wage earner. Today, it's 58,000 or something like that. And it takes two wage earners, your paycheck to paycheck, and they stimulated everything under 150. So why aren't we getting paid commensurate with the level of inflation because we're not asking for it. But now because it's because inflation is heated up so much that people are paying attention and noticing it, now they're asking for an increase in wages. And because the market's so tight for employees, they're getting it. But even so, it does not keep pace. It's not enough. Correct. <laughs> And so now we're in a wage price spiral, and this is when confidence gets lost. So we're in a we're in a really critical period right now. And I know personally, I'm I'm rushing to get finished with everything that I need. You know, the food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, community, and shelter. Those the the few little areas that I don't have covered yet, I'm rushing. I'm rushing. I'm nervous.